Um, I'm super excited about this word today that I'm going to share with you. Um, I have been traveling for the last day and a half. I have not gotten any rest. And uh, I'm wearing a two little shirt from the airport. That is a tie dye, but that's all I had. I didn't have any clean clothes. Got stuck in Atlanta overnight. Um, delayed the flight. There was a medical emergency on the flight, and then uh, delayed us again this morning. So we landed in Chicago and drove straight here for church. Amen. And I know that whenever those kinds of days happen, that means that somebody gonna get set free today. Woo! So I am excited about this word. Uh, I know that it's going to help somebody. And as we get ready to get into this word, um, I'm going to start off with a spoken word piece. That's not from me. Not from me. I'm not that good. But uh, we're going to start with a spoken word piece uh, from our own Cedric Hoare. He's going to start with this piece, and then immediately we'll go right into this word. All right. you have been selling to me and I would constantly buy all your products see I was your number one customer you advertised to me things you promised would replenish me but ironically every time I was starving I would end up feeding you see I should have known you never keep your word when I realized that for every purchase you never allowed for any returns I should never have skin pass reading your conditions and your terms See, when I was younger, I wasn't always this vocal. Speech issues had my confidence in the chokehold. Insecurity crept in and made me immobile. It felt like all the kids around me could make circles and I wasn't over. See, it wasn't until middle school that I fully became aware that I was black in a white school. Like all of a sudden, implicit racist comments were now seen as cool. I could have held my pen differently and I would have been labeled as ghetto. From the same kids only a few years ago, we were building the same cities with the same Legos, but now I was urban. Like all of a sudden, my blackness became a burden, no longer a person, but a different version. And it became worse and because when I got mad, best believe they could see my anger, but they didn't realize that I was hurting. See, they didn't realize that anger was just sign language for those who didn't know how to articulate their hurt. So it was hard to focus on classrooms because of what went down by lockers. And because my attention was off that day, my teacher decided to tell my class that I was lazy. A few days later, a rumor was started that I was getting high because I was crying in the bathroom. And when I got out, my eyes were hazy, but I guess when they just see you as black, you automatically become shady. Dented lockers by my fist were just depictions of a beat up heart caused by their insensitivity. See, being young, black, and angry isn't some innate proclivity, but maybe it's just expressed vividly because our hope and dignity is held in captivity by passed down generations of implicitly played out forms of bigotry, dear approval. In high school, I faced the lies told by acne coming at me told me that no girl could possibly receive the letters of my heart because of what was stamped on my face. So I didn't want to be seen. So I found safety in women on computer screens. But safety is just a fancy word for snares when your insecurity leads approval. When I was torn, you offered me porn. Promise would make me feel like a man without requiring me to actually be one. You said no vulnerability was required, just the expense of my strength. But even in my weakness, it seems like that is when I heard God's voice the most. See, it wasn't until high school when I realized that God defies contradictions and oxymorons. Tragedy is just opportunity to showcase his majesty. See, even in the pain of losing my best friend in his sleep, God somehow used death to wake me up because dreams can never be realized until we wake up, dear approval. College, I was 
was attracted to broken women because I would use their pieces to build me up. I would use their ruins to fortify my own castle. Listen, don't get it twisted. I was genuinely concerned about their pain. And taking advantage of them physically wasn't my game, but it just felt good that they needed me. Felt good that I could knit hearts back together that had previously been torn. Felt good to hear the sounds of sweet melodies that said, Cedric, you ain't like all them other guys. You see, when approval starts to hold hands with pride, you start taking on tasks that were only meant for God. Because a woman that draws herself to you rather than God is always subject by being let down by your flaws. And the approval I went so far to search for was now gone. If you let fear paralyze me from walking in my purpose, being afraid became crippling while comfort became a crutch. But it took injuries to help me realize that perfect love cast out fear. So brokenness became healed by, by, by divine rehab, so I put the cast away. Fear became the captain of a ship that made me a castaway. Seas to lands and rolls to recovery. Get deterred when you keep looking back, so I put the past away. So approval, now you're looking at the new me. I guess you could say the old me has passed away. But approval, you never knew my name. See, my name is Cedric, and my name means cheat, which means I just help people fight to overcome their battles. But chiefs only become chiefs because they are known to overcome battles of their own. See, my best friend that died in high school, his name was Aaron Battle. So I guess I had to go through a battle to finally live up to my name. So approval, call me by my name, because God already placed this stamp of approval on me before you even had an opinion. You tried to take it when I was younger, but now my weapon of choice is my voice. You tried to tell me that my voice was weak and that I needed anger management, but approval, now I'm a spoken word poet in the county. Counselor. Hey, I said approval. Now I'm a spoken word poet and a counselor. The same sticks and stones you tried to hurt me with, I'm now building with them. So now I can think of all I can accomplish because fear and approval are no longer options. So approval, you better carefully proceed with caution because I'm no longer letting pointless things have my purpose on auction. See, getting away from you was imperative because now I'm able to take your lies and change the narrative. So whether it's approval, loneliness, pride, depression, lust, anxiety, and security, Security, whatever your devil is, tell them that I'm no longer behind what you've been selling to me. Tell them that I'm no longer buying what you've been selling to me. Because when Christ purchased me, that automatically made Father, we thank you for every word that was just spoken. I pray that your people would hear your voice in the art form of poetry. That it would minister to them and not just be something to cheer for. That they would find the areas in their life that they're still seeking approval. That they would release it and now God be seen totally loved in you not needing another voice to cheer them on besides the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, as we get into this word, my only desire is that your voice would be heard, not mine. That you would do what you already said you were going to do in Yeshua's name. And the people of God say it. Amen. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. All the time. And all the time. Come on, God is good. And all the time, I'm going to say it one more time, God is good, and all the time, God is good. Sometimes you have to remind yourself of that, that God is good. No matter what you're facing, God is good. No matter what you're dealing with right now, God is good. No matter the condition of your mind, your heart, or your soul, God is good. No matter your circumstance, God is good. No matter your predicament. 
God is good. No matter what happened yesterday, God is good. No matter the phone call you received on the way here, God is good. See, the enemy wants to convince you that God doesn't show himself good to you. So you question who he is. Or worse, you question who you are. God, why am I so bad that my life always goes this way? One of my favorite things to do is to unravel the lies of the enemy so you can see yourself in your purest purpose in God. That's one of my favorite things to do. And I'm going to do it a little bit more today. We're still teaching in this Uncaged series. And uh, today we're teaching from Uncaged Faith. And um, today is going to be just like the beginning, if you would, maybe a, a stepping stone into something greater. Um, I had something else to prepare, but I was, I was up at night, last night, you know, speaking with God. It's, I, I realized the layover was supposed to happen, right? Our flight got delayed, and they were like, there's no other flights going out, and so we, we got to put you in a hotel. I, I didn't plan on being in a hotel that night. I planned on being in my bed. Um, and so we didn't get there until maybe 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, my wife went to bed quickly, as she always does. She just rests so well. I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's good. I guess you, you trust me, I guess. Uh, she just doesn't worry. She just goes right to sleep. But I'm, I'm always up, right? And so I was up looking over the notes, and I feel God kind of shifting my heart. So I spent some time in prayer, and God started uncovering some stuff to me um, about me, about our church, about the body of Christ kind of right now, uh, really in this topic of, of faith, right? And uh I'm just going to, I'm going to deal with just um, two different places of scripture. I'll, I'll be in Hebrews 11 and then also Mark 11. Um, so just to kind of start and give us a launching pad on faith and that will give us a couple of ways to walk through it and, and, and hopefully bring you along. Um, Hebrews 11 and 1 is like the biblical definition. Whenever somebody asks what faith is, Hebrews 11 and 1 is the verse that is read. And it is that now faith is confidence in what we hope for. An assurance about what we do not see. King James would have said, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But most of you don't even understand what that means. So I'll try to give two more definitions. One, a faith definition. Biblically would be a confident expectation or an internal knowing without having any external proof. Right? A confident expectation or internal knowing without having any external proof. And the simple definition I feel like would be the easiest for you to get today is this, a strong belief before anything happens or appears. A strong belief before anything happens or appears. And, and I'm sure you had that in your life before. Like before something happened, you just like, I knew it. It was there. I sensed it already. I tried to push against it. But this faith thing is a very important thing for us as believers um, faith is a very big part of our life. Proof that it's a big part of our life is in the same chapter, verse 6, Hebrews 11 and 6, New Living Translation, it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must first believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So this is powerful to me because it says, number one, it's impossible to please God without faith. And I used to look at that like, wow, like it's a, a lash or maybe it's a, a bad feeling, but really it's not. It's more so an awareness. It's like if you don't have faith, it's impossible to please God because anybody that comes to God must first believe that he exists. One of the biggest fights against your faith is the polytheistic beliefs that the world puts on you. Polytheism is to say that God is real, but there are other gods equal to him. So you pray to several gods at different times, which means that it's hard for you to really put your faith in that God existing because you believe in cosmos more than you believe in Yahweh. It's a real issue right now because sometimes I, I, I see people struggling. They're like, I, sometimes I pray to God. Sometimes to the universe and sometimes to the stars and sometimes to just different systems. And I realize that their faith really isn't in God. Their faith is in his creation. The universe is real because God created it. The moons and the stars are real because God created it. Somebody actually got mad at me because I said this, so I'm going to say it more so they can keep getting mad. <laughs> it's only real because God created it. I do believe in it, but I don't worship the creation. 
I worship the creator. He says, anybody that comes to God must first believe, number one, that he exists, that God is the creator of all, that he is supreme, that he is alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last, that which was, which is, and which is to come. That is the God that we serve. He existed before we knew he existed. He will continue to exist even if we lose faith that he exists. He is God all by himself. He is Yahweh. Now, I first believe that he is God. And number two, I must believe that he rewards me for seeking him. Man, that blesses me so much because when you, when you don't have this in mind, seeking God can feel like a chore. All right, thank you for the seven amens that were honest. But seeking God can feel like a chore when you forget that he said, I reward those that seek me. That he wants to be in relationship with you and he's not trying to find ways to put limits around your life so that you can live this strict diversion of you and never really enjoy everything that he's created for you to enjoy. That's never what it was about. He implicitly says that he rewards those that seek after him, that there is a reward, that there is a blessing in seeking after him. And I'm not just talking about the superficial stuff like new houses and new cars and get more money in your bank account. Like if all you want is money, then your dreams are very, very low. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a level of peace that cannot be purchased, right? I'm talking about a level of happiness, a level of joy that no amount of money can get you. He said, I will reward you with this. And more than that, I will reward you with knowing who you really are. Because the only way to know who you really are is to see him for who he really is. Because when you finally see him for who he really is and you catch a picture that you were made in his image and like him, you start to see who you are clearly. Because you cannot see who you are clearly until you realize who were you made after. There was a model, there was a mold that you were created in. God wasn't freelancing, just making different people. There was a mold that you were created in. God said, I want to make mankind in my image and after my likeness. Notice I said mankind, not man, because we get, we get tricked in that sexist thing. But he made mankind, which means male and female, in his image and after his likeness, which means man and woman. Both of you have God on the inside of you. All of his DNA, all of it is on the inside of you. The life, the power, the authority is alive on the inside of you. Now, when you get a hold of this faith thing, it becomes really, really big. The reason it becomes really big in your life is because you start to realize you were created to be a faith being. Say faith being back to me. That's how I know you're awake, you're not going to sleep. You were created to, because everybody wants to shout, but I got to kind of talk a little bit. You're created to be a faith being. What that means is your life was never set up to be responsive. All right. God did not create you to see something happen and then respond. You were created to speak first. And then whatever you speak begins to flow out in front of you. I'm going to have, we're going to teach this. We're going to teach this. That's what you were created as. That's what God did. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 2 and 3, it says, we understand by faith that God spoke and what God spoke became into existence. And God didn't stop there. When he created man and he brought the animals before Adam, God wanted to see something. He wanted to see, does Adam have the ability to function like me? So when he brought the animals in front of Adam, he said, what are these? And Adam began to see animals and he saw something that we didn't see. He began to call out names. He began to call them out. And the Bible says, whatever he he said that was the name thereof because God was testing his ability to function like him. Now, I'm saying that for, for, for a very, very important reason on this faith part. I'm saying it for an important reason because your life is the culmination of everything you've spoken. Oh, this is going to be good. Your life is the culmination or the total sum of everything you've spoken. And you may not recognize it, but you have to be careful that even when you're sad, you watch your words. You have to be careful that even when you're angry, you watch your words. That even when you're mad at those people, mad at your family, mad at God, mad at your condition, that you watch what's coming out of your mouth. Watch this, because the earth is taught to respond to what you speak. Get this. 
Because God gave you dominion, the earth knows you're cold, but you don't. So the earth knows that when you speak, it has to obey you. So when you're shooting wild because you're angry, the earth is still responding to your voice. These kids driving me crazy. You feel crazier, don't you? Talk to married people. Every time they say, I don't know if I can do this, more confusion comes in. Every time you say, I'm so angry, the anger you already have is multiplied and it continues to grow because you are a spirit being. And when you speak, the earth, right, has to respond to what it is that you're speaking. Now, this means a lot the more we get into this scripture, and, and, and I'll get into it actually because I want to I wanna hear him and really push this point that God spoke to me. We are in Mark 11 and 12. And we're in a specific part where uh, Jesus is, is walking through and he's hungry and he sees a fig tree and doesn't have any figs. So we'll read it and then I can teach it to you. Um, and, and let me tell you this, like this coming fresh off the press. So most of the time, like I got like six points and then break, nah, and none of that. Like I'm shooting from the hip right now, all right? So I hope you're all ready. All right. Mark 11 and 2, it says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. See, Jesus ate off trees. Hallelujah. Sing, amen, hallelujah. When he was hungry, he looked for a plant, not an animal, amen. Hallelujah. Whoosh, hey, how that felt good in my spirit. That felt, all right. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. It's funny that Jesus has always been a tree inspector. Always. He said, because leaves don't impress him. Fruit does. See, looking successful doesn't impress God. Now, like having money or having car or appearing to look like you made it, that doesn't impress God. God checks only for fruit. And it, and it doesn't how green your leaves are. If you don't have fruit, you're producing nothing. Uh, I keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Uh, he went to see if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now, what's, what, what used to baffle me about this scripture, sincerely, is that, you know, I, I, I used to question, like, did, did Jesus have an anger problem, you know? <laughs> You know, oh, because, you know, like, hungry, why wait? Like, you're not yourself when you're hungry because, like, he was hungry. And, like, he just cursed the tree. And the Bible says it wasn't even fig season. So it was not yet the season for figs, but he curses a tree for not having figs when it wasn't its season. Like, only Jesus can expect fruit early. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm blown by it, but then God had to open my eyes to, to show me that it was never about the tree not having fruit. This was specifically so that the disciples could understand the power of their words. This, this lesson has a deeper meaning beyond the surface. I'm saying that because I really pray that you would start to actually look at what's happening in your life because you may have one narrative about what's going on right now, but if you allow God to speak to you, he'll change the narrative. He'll let you see that you've been looking for something and miss what he's been saying about it the entire time. Hallelujah. I've been in places where I was frustrated saying God ain't spoke to me about it and the whole time he was speaking, but because what he was saying didn't match my narrative, I wrote it off. All right, come on, we're going to teach this, all right. So the Bible says the disciples heard him say it. And so Jesus says it, you know, may no one ever eat from you again. And, and uh, it's, he used the, the term may, right? So I imagine it wasn't like uh, a very strong apostolic. You know what I'm talking about? Nobody would ever eat from this tree ever again in the name. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't a strong, over-the-top, supernatural, spiritual kind of tone. He was just like, all right, so from today forward, you're not going to have any more fruit. Since you didn't have any today, nobody's ever going to eat from this tree ever again. Now, let's move on down to verse 20 because it says the next morning as they went along, so not even 24 hours later, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. So we got to catch this really quickly. This is going to be mind-blowing to the disciples 
Because the day before, the Bible says it, they saw plenty of leaves. Jesus saw the leaves, which was made him go to the tree. Not even 24 hours later, the tree is withered from the root. That means that seasons didn't change, the tree did. I hope you catch this. The seasons didn't change, the tree did. Now, I got a whole mess on that. I don't want to get stuck there too long. But, but our world gets so stuck in that my season is up. The season's still the same. You just gave up. I'm, oh, I, I felt that was uncomfortable. I got to stay there for just two, 60 seconds. You know, my, my season is up. I feel like God is moving me on. No, you got offended and found a reason to excavate or to leave and get out of town. But that was not God telling you your season was up. But offense can give you grounds to build your case against a season when you want to leave. It is so funny and fleeting how our emotional seasons change. You know, the seasons that I know is summer, fall, winter, spring. But the seasons we live in seems to have 12 different seasons every year. Up, down, going, hot, cold, yes, snow, in, out, up and down, wrong when it's right, black when it's white, we fight, we break up, we kiss and make up. <laughs> because we build our own cases, right? We blame the season, but really we're the tree. Like back and forth. God started speaking to me about this tree here, right? Like it withered up, it dried up, it changed instantly. I'm telling you right now, that's what happens when offense comes in. When offense comes in, when hurt comes in, when anger comes in, when doubt comes in, the thing that was on its way to fruit becomes dry with no life. Have you ever seen somebody change overnight to where you're like, ooh, that's ugly? Like I really saw, like, I, like all of a sudden I saw this person change and the person had leaves, but now I don't see the fruit that was on the way. I really had higher expectations for them, but now it's, I see something different. I, 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 wanna, I want you to see this in scripture. Please pay attention to this. It said, with it from the roots, verse 21, it says, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look. So Peter's amazed. He's like, yo, Yeshua, Rabbi, look at this. The fig tree you cursed has withered. Probably gonna mess up somebody's thinking right now. So when I be preaching, sometimes I have to pray in my spirit, like God, can I say this? Because I don't want people to, you know, because people sound bite you, like they take like ten seconds, and then like they'll say that you're teaching something that's not true. We bless and not curse. That's what we are as believers. But you, you can curse whatever isn't of God. All right. If something isn't of God, you can stop it with your words. You can speak against it. Some of us live our lives like whatever is happening is inevitable. All right? Like, like when something goes wrong, you just vic you victimize yourself and you're like, well, I just give up. It's, it's always me. It's always my life. Something always goes wrong with me. And I'm telling you right now, living like that, you are missing the whole purpose of being in Christ. Why be in Christ if you have to live like a victim like the rest of the world? Henry, if you're living like a victim, then you're not living like a blood-bought believer who now has the right and the authority of the kingdom of God. You are living like a person who was powerless and waiting on God while God is waiting on you. I'm going to prove that. I prove that. Okay, I prove it. I prove it. It's the, the same scripture. Um, he said, the, the fig tree you curse is with the Look at verse 22 says, Jesus says, have faith in God. Now, one of the things that can mess you up is that in the original Greek, this was written three different times, right? In the original Greek, it actually wasn't have faith in God. It was have the faith of God. All right. Now, why does that in and of change the entire meaning? Change the entire meaning. This is why. Because when I tell you have faith in God... You sit and say, well, I do. And I'm just going to do nothing until God does it. Seriously, right? Like, that's, I've been there before. Like, I do have faith in God. And God said this, so I'm going to sit here and do nothing because I believe in him. But it's not what it says. It actually says, have, have the faith of God. 
And I'll explain to you how that makes sense. Now, let's, let's pay a little more attention to the next verse, verse 23. This is my operative verse. It says, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, if anyone says, there was no prerequisite to who anyone was. So it didn't say if any preacher. It didn't say if any very spiritual person. Jesus was not even talking about Christians. I might have messed you up. He was talking about how you were created. You are created as a being to control the world you live in by the words you speak. That's why life and death is in the power of the tongue. And Jesus was teaching them the DNA inside of their code. And he was saying, if anybody understands how they were created, they can speak to this mountain. If anyone, if anyone, what's so powerful about that is you don't got to be a pastor or a preacher. Or you don't got to know all the Bible. Or you don't got to remember every scripture. You just have to know in whose image you were created. In. You were created in the image of God. If you understand you were created in the image of God, then you don't have to be me. You don't have to be a person who seems powerful. All you have to know is what is inside your DNA. Inside your DNA is an authority that God already underwritten in you that when you use your mouth, you control the world around you. Look what he says. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea. And does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen. It will be done for them. He says, so he's going to teach us two things. So this verse and the next verse goes into two things. So the first verse talks about your speaking. So remember where it's an uncaged faith. And today I'm just talking about speaking right now. So he said, you're speaking, which means that as you speak, your words will show how much faith you have. Your words will show how much faith you have. Your words will show, listen to me, how much faith you have. I am telling you, I'm a pastor. Please hear my heart. I'm not saying it to be a jab. I want you to hear my heart. I know so many people who are in church every day with no faith. No faith. Just, just listen to them talk. Hey, how's it going? Terrible. Nothing going right for me, pastor. When I try to go up, I go down. When I try to go right, I fall left. Like, you, you, you're sad and depressed about everything, and you will continue to be sad and depressed about everything because all you speak is sadness and depression because you don't know that your mouth is creating the world you are living in. How we all in the same city and see different things because your mouth literally creates the world you are living in. He said... First one is about how you speak, right? He says, so if you say to this mountain, be moved, it will obey you. It will obey you. Now, I need you to understand something. This is faith. Faith is a strong belief and awareness and knowing on the inside of you before it ever happens. So we're not talking about the people that said, I knew that was going to happen. I don't want you. That's not faith. All right. So don't wait till I get blessed and say, I always knew. Right. Or until something happened, like, I always knew that was going to happen. Like, that's not faith, all right? That's jumping on the bandwagon after success. I'm talking about faith is before anything happens, you already have a confidence on the inside of you. And you start to show your confidence by what's coming out of your mouth. All right? Now, look at verse 24, because that's what you're speaking. Now, look at what he said about what you're praying. Please catch this. If you don't catch nothing else, catch these last three verses, all right? What you're praying. Verse 24, it says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, past tense, and it will be yours. Now. This, this blew my mind. He said, okay, so I'm telling you, Jesus sees the lesson. He says, so you can say to any mom, leave and has to leave. He said, so this is what I want to teach you about prayer. He said, whatever you ask for in prayer, whatever it may be. So he didn't put a parameter around it. He opened up a space for relationship between us and God. What I love about that is it's beautiful when you understand relationship and not me saying you only can pray about this. You only can ask for that. I know there's a lot of prayer books and stuff that you read, but I'm talking about what Jesus said. He said, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Because you received it when you spoke it. The earth responds to what you speak and then people see it manifested. Now watch this. 
He says, if you believed it, if you believed it, it would be yours. God told me when I was in prayer last night, he said, they don't believe me. Honestly, I stopped for a minute. I, I started praying about myself. I want to be transparent. I started praying about myself. And I'm like, man, like, God, is there any place in me? And God showed me, like, yeah, there's some places you stop believing too. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a pastor. <laughs> See, most pastors don't tell you all this kind of stuff. They try to, like, pretend. But I'm serious. I'm like, no, no, I, I, I believe. Like, seriously. And, uh, and God was like, if you really believe that, you will never have a bad day. Ever. Because your world would always respond to the words you speak. And if you're having a bad day, that means you're responding to the world you're experiencing. You don't even believe that you can change what's happening by what's coming out of your mouth. You give it. And you know what I do? I, I'm one of those people that when I really get angry, I get quiet. Right. And God said, that's how you lose. Because when you really get angry, you get quiet. And the enemy knows that your mouth is your weapon. Mm. And the enemy knows your mouth is your weapon. He wants to keep you quiet. Because mm. if he keeps you quiet, you can't break free from the world he's trying to build around you. And some of you are living in a trap that your mouth has the key to get you out of. Oh. Yes. He said, they don't believe me. I'm going to change. Forgive me. I want to tell you what God really said. He said, y'all don't believe me. Because he had me included in it. See, I'm trying to put it on y'all. He said, y'all don't. There shouldn't be a worry in the house. There should never be a situation you complained about that you never spoken to. How are you complaining about situations you never spoken to? Some of us are complaining about kids we never spoke over. Complaining about relationships we never spoke over. Hallelujah. We're complaining about stuff mad at God for not speaking again when he already gave us the authority to change it with the power of our words. But we're mad because we're quiet and we want him to say again what he already promised and told us to open our mouth. He said, he said, when you believe it, if you really believe it, it's yours. Like, what? Like, all this time? All my life I had to fight? And one little secret they didn't teach me is that I didn't have to pray it a lot. I had to believe it the one time I prayed it. So I'm saying the same thing over and over in prayer. Some of y'all like me asking for God to do it again, asking for the money again, asking for the relationship again, asking for the marriage again. And God is like, the only reason you're asking again is because you didn't believe it the first time you asked it. <laughs> Woo! Woo because you didn't believe it the first time, you come back begging the second time. But when you believe that life and death is in the power of the tongue, you change the way you start talking to God. You change the way you start speaking in prayer. Proof that you don't believe it, you never prayed about it. Ask yourself, why you never pray about that? Why you never pray about it? Why? You're still struggling with your vehicle. Why you ain't never pray about that? You still want to be a homeowner. Why you've never prayed about that? Why is it that you're filling out the application, but you're not wrapping it in prayer? Here we go. I got here. All right. He said, they, he said, y'all don't believe. And I said, God, wait, wait a second. Wait, but, 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 you know, it's church. And, and God literally, like he, he hit me with something that like, that, that blows my mind. Seriously, to this moment right here. When he started showing me how many of us quote a Bible we don't actually believe. We don't actually believe it because if we believe that our lives will look very different, 
I'm not trying to condemn. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm, I'm not just talking about bondage and being free. God can do that. I'm talking about living your life as a person who has no power, waiting on a powerful God to do something for a powerless human. But that is not true. You are not a powerless human. You are a child of God, an heir to the kingdom. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. And the enemy wants you constantly waiting on a God who already showed up, died, and get back up so you can know who you are. We shouldn't be waiting on Jehovah's return. He's already in us. Look at verse 25. My last verse. I promise I'm done. I promise I'm done. He's, he's talking about faith. So honestly, it felt like this verse didn't even line up. Because if you just read through the Bible fast, you're going to feel like the subject's changed, but it's the same conversation. He's talking about faith. He says, you know, whatever you pray for, believe you receive it, it's yours. He says, and when you stand praying. And when you stand praying, because I stand when I pray, so I feel good when I read that. <laughs> but really, it's just I'll be sleepy in the morning. So when I lay down like some of y'all, I, I wake up 30 minutes later like, ooh, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> good prayer time. Um, but he says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Seriously, my whole life, I taught these as two different subjects. My whole life, right? Went to Bible college, everything for, right? Taught these as two different subjects. One of it is a faith subject. The other, the other part is a forgiveness subject. It wasn't until last night in prayer that God told me those are the same thing. Same thing. He said, people struggle with forgiveness because they don't have any faith in my word. They don't have any faith. So it's hard to forgive somebody that you feel like didn't get their stuff back. Like they did you wrong, but they didn't get back done to them because you're like, how you going to do me like that and just keep going on? So you angry right now because you actually don't believe vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You actually don't believe, no, uh, be not mocked, whatever a man sow, that shall he also reap. You don't actually believe that, so you hold on to unforgiveness, hoping that you will use that as a tool to never let that person back in. But you realize that holding on to that unforgiveness is actually robbing you of your faith. Because either I believe all of it or none of it. Because either I believe all of it or none of it. I mean, you struggle with unforgiveness to realize that why things aren't working out. You want to know why? You can't have faith and hold unforgiveness. Because it takes faith to release it. It takes faith to release people. It takes faith to say, you know what, God? It's not my job to get them back. It's not my job to make them pay. It's your job to protect me. And it's your job to keep me. But it takes faith to release people when you feel like they're getting away with what they did to you. It takes faith to release it. And so what's hindering your faith and how much scripture you're memorizing, it's the people you won't release in your prayer time. Oh, this is so good. It's what you won't release. And like, as I was talking to God about it, like I started realizing that this faith that we have was actually supposed to be the very thing that protects us from offense. And I didn't know that when I was offended, it was a weakness in my faith. It was a weakness in mine. So I'm like, huh, what? It's a weakness in your faith because you really don't believe that all things work together. For the good of them that love God. So they're called according to his purpose. All things work together. You're like, but no, not this one. All things. But God, they did this. God says all things. But God, it hurts. God says all things. But God is uncomfortable. God said all things. But God, I cried. God said all things. But God, I hate it. God said all things work together. That even when it's painful, God makes it work together for your good. But when you have faith in God, you don't struggle with that area. And I want to pray this today because this is just the start of this series. But I want, to, I want to, to, to pray this today that we would get in the place of actually believing God again. This is going to mean something, okay? Please hear me. 
because many of you, if you were to be honest with yourself, don't be honest with me. Be honest with you and be honest with God. You stop believing. That's why you went and tried to find it your own way. At one moment, you believe that God, God is going to do this and you would tell people. But now when people ask you about it, you change the subject. You used to tell me about what God was going to send, the kind of wife, the kind of husband God was going to bring, the kind of business, the kind of career. You used to talk about it. But now when people bring up the conversation, it gets an eerie silence. You don't know how to respond. You almost start looking for yourself. Well, God, who is it? Because you stop believing that he was going to do it. But to serve a God that you don't believe will reward you for serving him is slavery in his finest. Because God wants to reward you. He withholds no good thing. And I pray today, God, this prayer over them that every single person in this room will believe you again. That they will believe you again. Even the the, the one that's hurting and holding on to offense and unforgiveness, that they will realize it's killing them and it's robbing them of their faith. For the people who are living in dark circumstances, God, I've been there. I've been there, God, where finances were low and family was low and relationship was garbage and trying to figure out what's going to happen. And God, is when the faith was returned back into you that I saw life differently. God, I pray that every man, every woman in this room, God, will not use you only when it's convenient. Will not only quote scriptures only when they have a good place, but even in the uncomfortable seasons. And even in the hard days, and even in the weeks that are wrapped with tears, and even in the days that feel pain, that they will not become victims. They will remember that they are sons and daughters of the Most High. And that the life that they live is being reconstructed every day by the power of their tongue. We thank you for it in Yeshua's name. And people say it. Amen. Amen.